Hello and welcome back to Hilbert Spaces, the video course where we talk about inner product spaces and operators in them. And in today's part 6, we will talk about the geometry we have in inner product spaces and we will also define the so called orthogonal complement. However, as always, before we start with the details, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, with the link in the description, you can download additional material for all the videos. Okay, then let's start with our setup. So we have a vector space X together with an inner product. And now we already know that this inner product induces a whole geometry on the vector space X. And this is the reason why Hilbert spaces are so important, because we can do abstract geometry in them. So more precisely, this means that we can give meaning to lengths and angles. And indeed, the first thing we already know, because each inner product induces a norm on the vector space. You remember this fact we have discussed a lot in former videos, and now we will extend this discussion to a whole geometry. This means the inner product allows even more, now we can also measure angles with it. Or to say it more concretely, today we discuss how the inner product can define the term orthogonality. This means the inner product tells us if two vectors are orthogonal to each other. Indeed, this is not complicated at all, it just generalizes what we already know from the standard inner product in Rn. This means we have orthogonality if the inner product vanishes. And indeed, this definition is the same in the real vector space and in the complex vector space. Therefore, we say that a vector x in an inner product space capital X is orthogonal to another vector, which we call y as always, if the inner product vanishes. Hence, the inner product x with y has to be zero. So simply as that, this is what we mean by orthogonal. Moreover, the common way to write this is to use the perpendicular sign between the two vectors. So here you should remember, this symbol just means by definition that the inner product is zero. And obviously the term orthogonal is symmetric in both inputs, so we can simply say x and y are orthogonal. Moreover, we can also easily extend the term to a whole subspace of x. This means now we say that the vector x is orthogonal to a subspace and this one we call A. And there please note, this can be any subspace, in particular it could be an infinite dimensional one. And now the definition should be really clear. When we take any vector A from our subspace, then the inner product should be equal to zero. So we have this equality here for all A in A. And now we can easily visualize that, just imagine that we have a given subspace A inside our vector space X. And then the vector X has to be orthogonal to each vector inside A. Hence, in general, we would have infinitely many possibilities. However, in the end, we would use the same perpendicular symbol as we have it for single vectors. Indeed, you see that very often, because it's a helpful abbreviation when we talk about orthogonality. Now please note, we usually use this definition for subspaces in the vector space X, but actually I have written it down for general subsets. In fact, the definition also works in this case, and it makes it even more general. Moreover, it's also possible to say that two given subsets are orthogonal to each other. So we simply say that a subset B is orthogonal to a subset A if we can calculate the inner products and we get out zero. So more precisely, for every vector B in B and every vector A in A, the inner product B with A vanishes. So also here, it could happen that we have to check infinitely many inner products. And now also not so surprisingly, we use the same symbol even when we talk about subsets and subspaces. And now finally, the last definition of this video is the so-called orthogonal complement, which can be defined for any subset in X. 
So in short, the orthogonal complement consists of all vectors in X, which are orthogonal to the subset A. And the common notation we have for that is to use the perpendicular sign as a superscript for A. So this is the orthogonal complement as a subset in X. And what I've already said, we just take all the vectors in X, which satisfy that they are orthogonal to A. So this is a really short definition, and please recall, it just means that the inner products X with A all vanish. Therefore, we can also give a nice visualization for that, because we put all the orthogonal vectors into one set. So for example, if A is just given by a one-dimensional line, then it looks like this. And also the orthogonal complement is a whole subspace that is orthogonal to A. So you can immediately remember that the orthogonal complement could be an infinite dimensional subspace. And moreover, it's definitely always a subspace and not just a subset. So this thing and related stuff we can immediately collect in properties of the orthogonal complement. And these hold for any inner product space X and for any subset A inside. So the first thing I've already told you, a perp, the orthogonal complement of A, is always a subspace in X. So this is what we get from the linear algebra structure, but we also get something from the topological structure. Namely, it's a closed set inside our inner product space. So you should know this means with respect to our induced norm and our induced metric, we have a closed set. So please recall, this means that the complement of X without a perp is an open set. And their openness is a property we can define with respect to the epsilon balls, which is defined in every metric space. And since an inner product induces a norm and every norm induces a metric, this term is well defined in our inner product space. If you need more information there, you should check out my functional analysis course where we discuss exactly that at the beginning. Okay, so with that in mind, we could also ask if the closure of a set A changes anything in our orthogonal complement. And the answer is no, this does not change anything, we still get out our A perp. And in a similar way, we could also ask if we change anything if we go to the linear subspace spanned by A. So this might be a bigger set than A, so the orthogonal complement could change. But the answer here is exactly the same, we don't change anything, we still get out the same orthogonal complement. Okay, so these are the properties, and now we can write down a proof for them. And it turns out that this is not hard at all. For example, for statement A, we can just take any two vectors from our A perp, and then we can form the sum of them and put it into the inner product. And the only thing we have to do there is to combine it with an arbitrary A in A. And then the properties of the inner product allow us to pull out the plus sign and then we just have two terms. And both of them are zero by the assumption that X and Y are in A perp. Which means they are orthogonal to every A in the set A. Hence one property of a subspace is already satisfied, we cannot leave the subspace with the addition. And now the next property is really easy, we just show that the zero vector always lies in A perp. So this is easy because the zero vector inside the inner product always gives us the result zero. Hence the only thing that remains to show is the scalar multiplication. And there we can just use that we can pull out scalars from the inner product without any problems. The only thing you have to remember is that for the first component we get a complex conjugation. But obviously that simply does not matter here because we get out zero anyway. And this whole calculation works for any scalar lambda in our field F. And that's it, these three things tell us that we have a subspace in X. And as you can see, the only thing we needed in that proof is that in the definition of the orthogonal complement, we have the inner product. 
And actually, this is also all we need for showing the other parts. For part B, we want to show the closeness, and this can be done by considering sequences. So let's say we have a sequence xn completely inside our orthogonal complement, and the sequence should be convergent in x, but the limit could lie outside a perp. So let's call this limit lowercase x, and we don't know if this limit lies in a perp as well. Indeed, if we can show that it always lies in a perp, then we are done. Because if we cannot leave the set with a sequence, we actually have a closed set. Therefore, let's take any a in a, and let's consider the inner product xn with a. Then we know this is always zero, because xn lies in the orthogonal complement of a. So you see, this one here is a sequence of complex numbers, but the value is always zero, no matter what n is. Therefore, the limit of this sequence of numbers is definitely also zero. And now the only thing we have to do is to pull in the limit symbol into the inner product. And in fact, we can do that because the inner product is a continuous function with both components. This fact is not hard to show, because we already know that every inner product satisfies the cauchy schwarz inequality. And here we can just use this nice fact and then we get inner product x with a, which is also zero no matter which a in a we choose. Hence, by definition, this limit point x also lies in a perp. And now by using what we know from closed sets, we can conclude that the orthogonal complement is always a closed set. Okay, then I would say, let's quickly go to part C. And there you should know that for any set A, the closure is usually bigger, but never smaller. This means we always have this subset relation. And now it's not hard to show at all that the orthogonal complement always reverses such a subset relation. This means if we use the orthogonal complement on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, the subset just reverses. So this is a general relation between two subsets, and it tells us if we increase the set, then the orthogonal complement gets smaller in general. Okay, now in our part C here, the question is, do we also have the other inclusion? Indeed, if we have both inclusions, then we have shown the equality. So this is not so complicated, we just take an element from the left-hand side, so x comes from the orthogonal complement of a, and now we want to show that it also lies in the orthogonal complement of the closure of a. This means that the inner product x with an element b from the closure of a should be zero. And now we can just go to sequences again, because every element in the closure can be described by sequences of a. Hence, we always find a sequence a n, which converges to this element b. Hence, this one we can put into the inner product here on the bottom, and then you see we want to use the continuity again. Because then we can just pull out the limit. And that's exactly what we do here, and this solves the problem completely. Because now we have the inner product x with a n, and there we already know that it vanishes because x comes from the orthogonal complement of a. Hence, we get that x with b in the inner product is equal to zero, and this works no matter which b in the closure we choose. So the conclusion is that x lies in a overline perp as well. So this shows that subset relation, and together with the other one, we have shown the equality of the two sets. So you see, this is not so complicated, and a similar thing we can do in part D as well. Namely, there we also have that the span of A is a superset of A. And for that reason, the orthogonal complements will also change the order of the subset relation. So we already know that the orthogonal complement of the span cannot be bigger than the original one. And now you already know, similarly to before, we want to show the other set inclusion. So let's take an arbitrary x in a perp, and let's show that it also lies in span a perp. And for that you just have to know the definition of the span, it's just a set of all linear combinations of a. 
So we can scale vectors from A by scalars lambda j, and then we can sum up the results. So this is a general description of a linear combination which lies in span A. And now you already know, this one we will put into our inner product. And now it should not be a surprise for you that we can use the linearity of the inner product inside the second argument. This means we can simply pull out the sum and the scalars. And then what remains is simply the inner products x with aj, and there we know these are zero. This is the same reasoning as always, because x comes from the orthogonal complement of a. Therefore, we always get zero out, no matter which linear combination we choose. And there we have it, the result is that x lies in the orthogonal complement of span a. And this shows the second inclusion, and therefore we have the equality of the two sets as well. And there I can tell you, this formula explains why we usually talk about orthogonal complements of subspaces. And moreover, all these formulas help us if we want to form the orthogonal complement twice in a row. However, what comes out there, I want to show you in the next video. So I really hope we meet there again and have a nice day. Bye bye.